Hello, my beautiful sister, Sheila. You know what? Mm -hmm. Of all the people I knew, you were like one of the amazing people that I couldn't wait to have on my podcast show. Oh, that's so sweet. And it is like, you know, finding people who are true to themselves and walking their uniqueness, that's not, that's like a rarity. You know, it's like, I got to be a carbon copy of somebody else. I got to be what somebody else want me to be. I got to appease these people. So I need to show up this way. Mm -hmm. But girl, when I tell you, you walk in your uniqueness, you walk in it. And can't nobody walk it like you do, girl. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Same to you, you know. <laughs> You're such a model of that that principle, which is probably why you recognize it so easily in others. Yeah. But you know, the fun thing about life is all the different people I get to meet and experience. And the more people walk in that uniqueness, the better my experience is with them. So mm -hmm. that means I'm only going to have a one of a kind experience with the person before me because there's no other one but that person. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm like, that's what drives me to keep meeting new people. What, what can I experience today? What can I find ab out about somebody's joy or happiness or hobbies or interests that I didn't even know existed? And when you really start talking with people, you really like, wow, that is amazing. I think I'd like to try that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it kind of open up your, it, it opens up your world and make you feel like, hey, you know what? I never even knew that existed. And the things that you share and the things that you do, the way you do it, I never heard, well, I'm not a worldly person where I've traveled the world, mm -hmm. but I know some things, but you were a happy addition <laughs> to my to my world and you brought something so that was so like, I never even heard of it, never even experienced anything that you share. So I just want to welcome you to the uh, my podcast show, which <laughs> is called Your Gift Will Make Room For You with Cheryl T. Ricks. I and love that. Sheila, I just want you to be comfortable and just have a fellowship with me and let me have a fellowship with you. I don't have a list of questions. We're just going to let it do what it do. Mm -hmm. And you just share whatever it is that you want to share. But what I'd like for you to do, first of all, is to introduce yourself and tell me about how, how God is using you in the community with your gift, talents, and abilities. Wow. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am so honored to know you, but I'm even more so honored to know that you think so highly of me that you would want to share me with your audience and your colleagues and the people that you love and care for. So that is truly a sign from the most high that I'm headed in the right direction. Because I know Sister Cheryl, she don't do everybody. <laughs> And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you. And um, and I have, too, learned so much from you about how to stay centered in my own power and how to honor the accomplishments that God has seen me through and to savor the moment and especially to honor the women in my life. And if there aren't that many to reflect on what may be happening inside that might be blocking or preventing me from being able to establish very meaningful relationships. And so I appreciate one of the things that you've blessed me and other women with, which is your book, Sister Circle. Um, I think that book is so beautiful and it has helped me so tremendously. And in fact, when you kind of introduced the book to me. I was describing to you something I was going through with my own son. And it was like you had a whole chapter in your book devoted to that topic. And when I heard you, you coaching me through the experience and helping me to process what I was going through. And then I picked up the book. I was like, am I on the phone with Sister Cheryl? 
For sure. Because reading it is just like having a conversation with you. So from an author to an author, I appreciate you and what you're doing. And now that you're opening up this amazing new platform where people can see you and hear you and connect with your personality and bring other women who are also in this space with you together, I think that is tremendous and exciting. And so I've just given a clue to what I do in part, and that is besides being a daughter of the Most High, which is my first and most uh, prestigious position, I'm a mother, which is my second and most prestigious position, and I am an author. I am an attorney. I am a a strategic planning facilitator and a divine self-care strategist and health coach. Um, I have worked in this, all of these spaces over the course of my 46 years um, in and out, and they're all interconnected because at the core of this work is helping women to recognize that they come here to fulfill a divine purpose in their life. And the health piece means that you have to honor your temple and take care of your temple, including what I refer to as the crown, which represents the entire head, not just the hair, but the head, which includes the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the mouth. And how when you take care of the crown, you experience not just divine eyesight, but good physical eyesight, and not just physical hearing, but divine hearing so that you can hear from the voice of the creator and not just speech, but the ability to give divine speech that can transform people's realities, that can speak into them and bring life into the world. Just like we create life with our womb, which I refer to as the throne. So this temple not only consists of a crown, which is the head encompassing the brain, the eyes, which are the lamps of the skull, the soul, the lamps of the soul, as the scriptures say, the ears, which enable us to detect that which is good and that which is evil when we are in tune with the creator, the mouth, which allows us to not only consume divine nutrition, but to also give it back, back to the world in the form of divine speech. And then the nose, which enables us to inhale that which is righteous, the breath of life, and to exhale that which is not needed any longer, right? And so this crown, as I talk about in my book, The Divine Self-Care Strategy, A Wellness Guide to Total Body Alignment, I'm introducing some very profound and deeply spiritual and important concepts for our daughters and our sons who are going to be relating to our daughters in some capacity prayerfully as fathers, as sons, as husbands, as brothers, as caretakers, as community leaders. And so this book that I have written is really a a gift and a representative of one of the powerful downloads that I got from the Most High about how to communicate with people who I probably won't have an opportunity to meet because It's a forward thinking book. I'm a visionary. And so I don't just think about what Sheila needs right now, but I'm thinking about the Sheila's to come, my future granddaughters and grandsons, your future great, 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 great granddaughters and grandsons, which is why you're doing the work you're doing. So that when we leave here, we'll leave a a guide print, a blueprint, a, a guide post to help others facilitate their processing, their critical thinking, and their awareness about how we manage our problems, how we develop and uh, design solutions to them, and more importantly, what our relationship was to to the people in our lives and how we worked to perfect those relationships and how we work to perfect our relationship with self. But more importantly, to always remember that we are the daughters and sons of the most high God. And so that everything that we do for ourselves, our family, our community must be rooted in this level of divine divine intention. And so I speak with an awareness that some of God's daughters and sons might might speak the Christian 
um, doctrine. And some of them may be somewhere else. They may speak uh, another religious, spiritual, and in the, the monotheistic religions that at least still honor the fact that there's a most high. And so I've written the book with that in mind, so that anyone who still has a humble enough spirit to say, I know one thing, I am a daughter of the most high God, right? And I want to stay in that space. And I want to communicate with self, with the creator and with community from that space. And in order to do that, I need to be in alignment with that which is divine, which is the light of the kingdom. How can my body, my temple, my sacred temple be used as an instrument to fulfill my divine purpose. And that was the reason why I wrote the divine self-care strategy, because I got some very powerful downloads from the creator about how he has always given us these elements of air, fire, earth, and water to not only secure freedom for ourselves, not only to improve the quality of our life in good times, but to secure our health. And when we stay as close as possible to these four elements in the form of their most, most divine and natural state, and when we bring the most high into the equation, we begin to see the herbs of the world as our medicine and food. We begin to see water as not just something that we consume to hydrate our bodies, but something that enables us to refresh our spirits and cleanse our bodies and remove not just dirt, but to also engage in what Dr. King referred to as those baptismal waters that allows us to realign ourselves with the creator. And so there's this powerful legacy of air, fire, earth, and water that the Most High revealed to me has always been present and that even our ancestors at their most debasing point in history over the last 400 years, starting with Mother Harriet Tubman, Mother Harriet Jacobs, the first enslaved woman to write her own biography and who revealed to us some of the major atrocities that were happening to Black women during their enslavement. We know that because of her. Frederick Douglass, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Booker T. Washington, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, and the revolutionary Reverend Nathaniel Turner, aka Nat Turner. Each one of these individuals left us a powerful clue about how we have continuously and consistently used the four elements, Sister Cheryl, in connection with the divine one. These people talk about things that the scriptures talk about in a very meaningful way. For example, Mother Harriet Tubman told Sarah Bradford, the woman who penned her biography, that what guided her to and fro, New York and Maryland, Canada and Maryland, on her many sojourns to freedom and to in, and free enslaved people, was that there was a cloud in the sky during the day that, that only she could see. She called it an invisible pillar of cloud by day. And she said that at nighttime, there was a fire in the sky that guided her about where to go. And the cloud during the day guided her about where to rest. That is vitally important. That's a part of our legacy that the Most High never abandoned our people, that the Most High was always using tools that were available and accessible to us. Frederick Douglass made a powerful statement in 1852 when he was standing before 600 people who considered themselves friends of the enslaved because slavery was still a very prominent thing. He had fought himself tooth and nail out of slavery. But this was the 4th of July. They were celebrating, of all things, their freedom from the British from slavery, from the British. And they invited this black man to come and celebrate their freedom with them. And he took the stage and he humbled himself and thanked them for the opportunity. And, and then he let them have it. And at one point in his speech, he says, it is not the light we need, but the fire. It is not the gentle shower, but the thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the 
earthquake. And I said, hmm, the four elements are right here. I heard it. I heard water for sure. He said gentle shower and storm represents both water from the rain and air from the wind. He said, we need the earthquake. That's the earth element. And he literally said, it is not the light we need, but the fire. Now, if people already have their freedom from slavery from the British, why would they need fire and earth and water and light and, and air? What would they need that for? They're already content. They didn't need it. His people needed it because they were still enslaved. And what the Honorable Frederick Douglass did next was really, really interesting because then he goes to invoke the incredible destructive power of water in the form of a metaphor with rivers and nations. And he goes on to talk about how how great streams are not easily turned from channels worn across the ages. They may sometimes rise in stately majesty and inundate the land. And then he goes on to talk about how sometimes they wither up and withdraw and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock. But what was so incredible about what he did at the end of this metaphoric revelation was that he says, as with rivers, so with nations. And so this was a bold black man having the audacity to stand in front of 600 white folk, right? No disrespect to anybody, but this was the reality of his world at the time. The world was black and it was white. It was free and it was enslaved. And the only weapons that he could call on, because he didn't have guns, he didn't have cannons, but he remembered the children of Israel. And how God used those same elements of fire, of water parting the rivers. And he wanted that. He was putting God on notice that I'm calling you out. It's time for you to move on behalf of your people. But he was also putting the people on notice that if you do not reconcile, I have so much faith in the creator, that if you do not reconcile with your oppressed masses, you will have to contend with these elements. Now, what's so interesting is these four individuals, Mother Harriet Tubman, Mother Harriet Jacobs, Booker T. Washington, and Frederick Douglass, all of whom had some powerful insights to share about this relationship, this sacred relationship that we have with air, fire, earth, and water. What's so interesting is that each one of them had the unique experience of being both enslaved at one point and free in the same lifetime. That's interesting because the download that I received from the Most High was that you have everything you need to secure freedom and health. And my response to the creator was like, what? All you've ever given us was air, fire, earth, and water. And the response was exactly. And I was directed to study that speech about Frederick Douglass. And what was so beautiful was that I ended up writing a chapter in my book. It's the chapter that I reveal these powerful insights about how our ancestors strategically used the four elements in alignment with the Most High to secure freedom and health. And I would proffer, Sister Cheryl, that today, our sons and daughters need to have access to that powerful insight because if at some point in the future, they may find themselves needing to secure freedom and health, they have a precedence. They have some historical data that you have a relationship with the Most High through these elements and what was done before can be done again. And so I use that as the cultural basis so that our children will enjoy knowing that they hail from powerful freedom fighters, healers, medicine people, doctors, all the way back to ancient Ethiopia and even ancient um, Africa, all the way from South Africa up to ancient Egypt is loaded with references to doctors, medicine men, and inventors who were using these elements in very sophisticated ways long before colonialism to improve the conditions of the world 
eliminate disease and successfully do so and to bring healing and freedom into the world. That is their legacy. And that is what I sought to accomplish through this book. And then I set out to show them how they could actually engage in some very powerful but simple healing exercises using the four elements. And I even provide them with the instruments to do so. Things like these ear candles that are designed to remove wax, debris, and toxins from the ear, like yeast and things like that. And how I have taught them how to use essential oils to remove toxins and bad bacteria from the mouth to secure the the better mouth and teeth health so that you can facilitate your own um, functions of the mouth. I teach our children what the structures of this face are. I talk to them about what the nose is, what the eye are, what the eyes are, how the eyes operate, and why you have to be so careful what you apply to your eye, how frequently you apply to your eye, and how you properly cleanse even your eye, Sister Cheryl. Like I teach them that there is a thermal heat process. In other words, you can cure very many eye infections with just heat. The problem is, and, and doctors tell you this too, if, oftentimes if you can't get to the doctor to get an eye treatment and you've got pink eye or some kind of stire in your eye, the first thing they'll tell you is take a clean white cloth and make as water the water as hot as possible and flush the eye with the cloth. That's a thermal heat treatment to remove bacteria and viruses from the eye. Well, what the, what the Most High revealed to me was that he created a potato which holds heat for up to 20 to 30 minutes. And if you bake that potato and apply it over the eye where it doesn't burn the skin, you have a barrier, that you can actually kill conjunctivitis and some of the deadly viruses, but you can also help treat um, the strain that we experience from staring at screens all day. And this is an important tool because it's an all natural, it's earth-based. You're using the organic earth, the potato. You're using fire in the form of heating the potato. You're using air in the form of the steam that creates the heat that generates the, the steam and the heat that purifies the eye. And then you actually use water because you're generating sweat. So all four of the elements are right here. And these eyes correspond to the fire element. That's why the scriptures say your eyes are the lamp of the soul. Your ears correspond to the earth element. Your nose corresponds to the air element. That's why it breathes in air, breathes out oxygen, ox carbon dioxide. And your mouth right now, as we're speaking, is probably generating water. That's the water element. Right here on our face, Sister Cheryl, we have all four of the elements. The Most High has been telling us all this time that everything that we need to secure freedom and health is right here on the earth. He's a complete God. He will not leave us here without the resources that we need. But we have to have people who are divinely inspired by the creator to be able to hear the voice of the creator so that we can tap into this wisdom. And I'm so grateful that I was selected to do it through my new book, The Divine Self-Care Strategy, A Wellness Guide to Total Body Alignment, Amen. which is available on Amazon and on my website at queendomcare.com. We will be back after this message.
Amen. Now, you know, that was a lot that you shared. It was so fascinating, all of it. And one of the things that I know that you're doing also is preparedness. You know, what do we do when things are not as plentiful as we used to have in them? Tell us some more about your preparedness um, services. It's interesting that you say that because that is another gift, a gifting of me. Um, I have been engaging in what people call preparedness for quite a few years now. Um, my reasoning for doing so was based off of my personal experiences with personal crises, with uh, food insecurity, if you will, with job insecurity. And so I had a, several experiences that made me appreciate how important it is for me to be a good custodian of the earth, right? And to put some aside. We have scripture that talks about how Joseph, right, who rose up in Egypt, was prepared for a famine and kept all of the nation fed in ancient Egypt because he had put aside certain reserves for famine and tough times. We have a man who is known as the prophet Noah, who warned people, get prepared, get ready, turn your life over, watch the signs, look for the water, right? And he was constantly preparing, not just for himself, but for the, the animals. He was gathering them and he was gathering these resources. So this is not a new and absurd concept for us. It's having the wisdom to be able to see and read the times and recognize that although the world is very unpredictable, there are some things that we can logically predict accurately. Like we can see that there's some political turmoil, that there might be a war. And when war happens between great powers, that there could be an interruption in the flow of goods and services. We recently saw how during COVID-19, you couldn't necessarily get an appointment with your dentist for six to seven months because dentists were being mandated to shut their offices down. And so what happens when kingdom people uh, find themselves in a world that is being turned upside down? Well, we're prepared for it because we can read the times and we can also interpret and we can be good custodians of the reserves and the resources that we have. And when you couple that, that wisdom with prayer and fasting, you have the self-discipline that you need to make wiser decisions. You buy yourself time so that you're not thrust into emergency circumstances. You buy your time. You can sit back and analyze situations a little bit before people are being fear mongered into doing or engaging in certain behaviors, you know? And so if you've got a little something to the side, if you've got a way to purify water, if you've got a way to store water, you know, even FEMA tells us that for every per person in your household, you should have uh, 14 gallon, you should have two gallons of water per day. In other words, have 14 days worth of water for each person in your household. And if you have a household of four, that's one gallon of water times four times 14, right? So what does that look like? So you don't feel so overwhelmed when you realize, wait, I've never put any water to the side and I can't get to the grocery store and I still got to feed my family. And they're saying that the, the city is on lockdown and I can't even order Uber Eats or anything like that. And so what do you have in place so that life continues for yourself and your family as normally as possible? That's my take on what many people refer to as emergency preparedness. It's having some resources right here at your disposal that allows you to respond intelligently, appropriately, and in a state of calm to circumstances around you that might not look so calm. See here in the U.S., we've been relatively spoiled. We look out at third world nations and second world nations, if you will, and see them dealing with bombs and dealing with uh, riots and dealing with coup d'etats and dealing with, you know, the worst of nature's elements and the worst of mil militarization right there in their face. It's in their home. It's on their street. We are relatively protected from that. And so it's very important for us to be mindful of the fact that 
the world is changing very rapidly. And we too need to be appropriately equipped to respond because our children need us. Our community needs us. And we don't want to be burdens on the state. We are the children of the most high. And so we have been advised and informed that we need to know how to prepare ourselves for difficult times and times of abundance. And there's nothing spooky about it. It's very logical. And there are lots of ways to do it. And that's what I helped people to do. I particularly focus on making it something very logical, something very tangible, but something very meaningful that connects our cultural experience, um, our history with these types of crises, and also our spiritual foundations. And I teach these principles as a course or a workshop called the nine pillars of emergency preparedness that every person of African descent should know. And the reason I focus on people of African descent, Sister Cheryl, because I know as a businesswoman, you are always advising me the world is a much larger basis and people do benefit from my work. But there are a group of people who are very adverse in our community to the idea of thinking in terms of these ways for whatever reasons of the past or culture. But these are the same people. If you look at the most recent disasters like Hurricane Katrina and these other events, these were the people who were the most vulnerable. And so it would behoove our people in particular, but all people to know a little bit about what makes the world go round and what made it sit go unaround, right? And how you can best position yourself, especially if you are a parent, to be able to intelligently and responsibly let your children know that I know things don't look good and that school is closed or that the government is saying we can't go outside right now, or that the food that we used to get so much in abundance doesn't feel like the same kinds of food in the same quantities in the grocery stores. But mama and daddy has got you. We're going to eat and we're going to eat well. We're going to drink. We're going to drink well. We are going to do things a little bit differently. And we're going to be internal sometimes, but we got you because we were thoughtful. We were contemplative. We were wise with our resources. We didn't waste. We didn't take for granted and just say, oh, God got it. Of course, God got it. God got you so that you can be his representative, his diplomat on the earth and his custodian. It's not that you go begging people for the things that you should have seen were going to be needed, whether that's soap to cleanse your body or bleach to help purify water if the pipes decide that they don't want to work for us properly, and also how to arm ourselves with resources and knowledge about what makes this world go round. Water just doesn't flow magically out of thin air and appear in your faucet. It comes from somewhere. We have to assume more responsibility for understanding how our systems work, whether that's water, whether that's power, whether that's electricity, whether that's food, whether the production of these things and how they are properly maintained or not so that we can respond appropriately when there is a disruption to life as we know it. That's what I work on. And that's what I help people do with the nine pillars of emergency preparedness, Sister Cheryl. That's wonderful. Now, one of the things that I heard about your teaching it was that there is some simple things that you share that everybody can use, even before taking your workshop or doing the uh, program itself. Share with um, our audience some of those basic things that we can do in the form um, of re readiness and preparedness for something mm -hmm. that may happen. And we've had certain incidents where the water was not available or it was contaminated what would what would you recommend that we do um if our water supply was 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 contaminated or what would we need to do what we do what do we need to know to do in circumstances like that well i think what i would like to share with your audience is that we need to think of the three or the four elements right think of water for hydration water for cleaning water for 
the uh, cooking water for everything that we need. So water is one of the most important things that you can directly control. Air is a little bit different. You can get air purifiers, but you can't stop a nuclear, you know, fallout from having an impact on the air. But you do need to know what you can do. I surround my home with plants. They are natural purifiers, right? To help purify the air. But when it comes to water, this is a particularly important thing because the threats to water and the water systems come from natural disasters and man-made disasters. Things like um, floods that can cause um, levees to overflow, that can leak um, water, leak contaminated waters into our water supply and water reserves that comes into our sinks and faucets. And so one of the things you need to be aware of what's called a, a boil notice. Sometimes the government may get notice that something has interfered. Like in Philadelphia, about two months ago, they were told, um, do not drink. They were given a do not use water advisory. Sometimes you get a boil water advisory and sometimes you get um, a, a do not, uh, there's a boil water, there's a do not drink and then there's a do not use, right? So each one of those things have different meanings. If you get a boil water advisory, that means that you cannot drink the water coming out of your faucet unless you boil it. You can do some things with it, like you can garden your, uh, you can uh, water your garden as usual. Um, you might not want to use that water to wash your hands without boiling it and to wash dishes. Why is boiling so important? Boiling, it is important to know, does three things. The three harms to water are parasites, bacteria, and viruses. When you boil water, you typically eliminate all three of those threats. So if you get a boil water advisory, you cannot cook with that water, you cannot drink that water, and you should not technically bathe people with that water, especially babies, because they may drink it even if you bathe them, or their skin may be sensitive or have tears. So typically, um, you can, as an adult who's healthy, you might be able to uh, use water to, you know, help create hygiene. You can still use it to flush your toilets and things like that, but no cooking, no drinking. And really you should use purified water or bottled water if you have access to it. Now, there's another way to deal with water that's filtering water, but filtering water only gets rid of parasites. It does not address viruses and it does not address bacteria. Another thing that you can do is to disinfect water. This is when boiling is not possible or feasible. That is where you chlorine, use chlorine bleach. It has to be unscented bleach. You should always have a bottle or two of pure bleach, chlorinated bleach. Clorox makes that sometimes. And you have to pay attention to what the percentage is of the sodium hypochlorite. That's the key act ingredient. What you want to do is if you've got um, a, a boil water advisory or you aren't able to boil that water, you would try to disinfect that water using the household bleach. And for every one gallon of water that is clear, you would use between eight to 10 drops or less than one fourth of a teaspoon of bleach that is five to nine percent sodium hypochlorite. Now, I know that I'm sharing a lot of information, so I created a worksheet, a cheat sheet, if you will, that I oftentimes give to the people who take my course, and I will be happy to share that with your audience. All they have to do is text the word water safety to 202 nine five two six one two three and i will send them a link to access my uh, four page cheat sheet that talks to you about how to make your water safe what boil water notices are what the what is the proper way to boil water because the boiling the the timing starts you want to boil the water for one minute but the, that timer doesn't start until you get an active boil so it's not one minute turn on, on the stove and then you boil it until it gets hot. No, no. Boil the water, allow the water to bubble and boil. And then you start the timer at one minute. That's the way to properly boil water. If the water is 
um, like a dark color coming out of your faucet, it's not as clear, it's a little bit cloudy, then that water you can also disinfect or if boiling is not possible, right? And you can always do a combination of all three of these things. But you want to make sure that you smell the chlorine in the water. Now, water is already chlorinated. That's why we call it chlorinated water, right? It comes out of your faucet. It's already treated with chlorine. But when your water is compromised, what they're saying is something has gone amiss and your water is not treated properly. So if the water is cloudy, you would simply double that amount of chlorine. If you were unable to boil, for example, and the water, when you look at it, it appears cloudy. What you would do instead of just using less than one fourth or eight to 10 drops of bleach, you would use 16 potentially drops of bleach or almost a half of a teaspoon. And you would stir that and you would wait for 30 minutes and then you would smell it. If you do not smell chlorine, you would do the process again and wait another 30 minutes. Wow. Now, what you can do to improve the taste of the water is simply pour the water from one container to another a couple of times. That will help. That is so, amazing. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. That is just like, you know, there's so many um, things that God has given to people to help humanity. And um, because you're allowing God to use you to do the things that he equipped you to give to humanity, we all are benefiting with all the different things that's going on in the world today, knowing that you have knowledge and wisdom about these preparedness things and, and how to not let a history repeat itself. And we can learn from history and we can actually learn how to make life better for all of us. And it, it's really amazing uh, when you think of how God is using your gift, talents, and ability to make room for you and um, help mankind in ways that other people aren't really doing it. And um, the whole purpose of the Your Gift Will Make Room For You um, podcast show is to help people realize that God has given all of us a download. He's given all of us gift, talents, and abilities, and we must utilize those gift talents, but we must give them to the world. We must give them to humanity. We must share them and not keep them to ourselves. And sometimes on this road of destiny and purpose, which I call it, uh, we can get complacent or we feel like, you know, we don't get the support we need. We, we're just not able to find the resources that we need to really get these gift talents and ability out to the world. But for some reason, you were able to go on the world stage with the UN. <laughs> <laughs> and you were able to share what you do with the world. So tell us about how your gifts was able to bring you to the UN um, in Geneva. That is so, so relevant and so, so timely. And I thank you for sharing that. So um, I, I work with a non uh, governmental organization called the International Civil Society Working Group for the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. And um, the United Nations has what's called a permanent forum on people of African descent. And this working group went there and I went there as a delegate. Now, the UN holds these conferences and they invite people from all over the world to come and share their stories of um, oppression, of trials, of solutions to these issues, of the issues impacting girls and women, the issues impacting prisons, the issues impacting education, every facet, people have something to say. And they bring this opportunity to the United Nations. Now, this happened in the 1920s when the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey was roaming the earth. And he did something in Madison Square Garden in New York called the First Convention of the Negro Peoples of the World where 25,000 people of African descent gathered in New York to do this very thing. But things have changed. And so now people turn to the United Nations to express these concerns and to expect solutions for them. Whether that's effective or not is to re an argument to be remade. But I had the opportunity to go because I'm I'm concerned about the conditions impacting girls, impacting women of African descent, impacting people of African descent in general. And uh, we have opportunities to do what are known as side events. And the United Nations will actually evaluate your side event. And if they determine that it's consistent with the principles that they have set out and their guidelines for 
emergency preparedness, water safety, um, the safety of women and, and children, education, health, then they will make it an official United Nations side event. Well, guess who submitted an, uh, a side event to, <laughs> to present and was accepted as an official United Nations side event was my nine pillars on emergency preparedness that every person of African descent should know. And that was the basis for it because it had to be relevant and culturally competent to the theme of people of African descent. And so I created a very powerful workshop and it was meant to be just three hours, but people were so excited and informed by the content that they ended up staying over an hour extra to ask questions, to share thoughts, to, you know, do this critical thinking exchange with me. And that was what you were referring to. It is officially an internationally recognized course on emergency preparedness for people of African descent. And the Most High has charged me now with creating um, a way to get this work that I do in front of uh, municipal bodies, in front of churches, in front of organizations, nonprofits, for-profits, anyone who has an ear to hear my four-hour workshop or my eight-hour workshop, I am willing and able to bring what the Most High has blessed me with in this very logical and very clear, precise format that will help people uh, be better equipped to manage the challenging times that may be lying ahead head for us. We will be back after this message. That is so awesome. Now, you know, one of the things that happen when God is making room for our gifts, talents, and abilities is that we have to evolve. Prior to you going to speak at the United Nations, having this, this world stage, what, what was it like for you as Sheila going from where you were to where you are to go and speak before the world, what transformations took place in you and what happened after that experience? Well, <laughs> as you already know, because you're my sister friend and you helped coach me through this process, but we're going to share it with everyone else. And basically this was my second United Nations session. I went to the one in Geneva, Switzerland in May. So this is May and then June, like back to back. And that was my first time out of the country as an adult. So it was a very powerful and world um, changing experience for me because I had been working at my law firm and I was not living a fulfilling, purposeful work life. You know, I was always doing my divine work on the side, but I was finding myself feeling more and more diminished spiritually, mentally, and physically with every day that I stayed at this firm. I didn't feel appreciated, valued, and there was no room for growth. And I had gotten to a point where it was no longer serving me in my needs. And so when I came back, when I was in Geneva, I, I knew I was going to have to eventually transition out of that job. But when I got back, a series of events happened that evinced for me that the time is now. 
that there is no more room for this kind of foolishness. Like I have seen another way of being in the world. That the Most High has shown me that there is a way and a space for me that my gifts, talents, and abilities can be used for the divine purposes he created me for. And that all I had to do was step out in faith. And this discomfort I was feeling was the sign that I needed that it's time to give your two weeks notice. And so when I got back from Geneva and found that these events had transpired um, that I felt were malicious and unnecessary and were meant to debase me and to undermine me and to make me feel less than that. I said, okay, I appreciate you doing that. Here's my two weeks notice. I will be leaving on May 30th. <laughs> and that is exactly what happened. And it was just so cool. Ho so happened to coincide with my trip to New York, which also further confirmed for me that there is a space for me, like you said, that your gifts and talents will make room for you. So please continue to pray with me that the divine resources of the abundant kingdom of heaven will continue to pour down on me and that I will not be in lack for any way so that I can pour this gift into the world and help others um, prepare themselves mentally, physically, and spiritually for the changing times that we're in, but also to also fulfill their divine purpose in the world because there is some beautiful things that are happening at the same time and we need to position ourselves always to be ready to step into the shoes of our um work and our purpose yes yes and you know the funniest thing about this journey of destiny and purpose and allowing your gifts to make room for you before great men and wonderful people around the world is that we have to get comfortable at being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, we can live life and we can, you know, get used to the mundane and the, the status quo and the same old, same old. But when God calls you and say, you know what, I'm finished with this. I'm finished with you over here. I need you to go here. And like, like where? It's kind of like Abraham he <laughs> told his feet when God told him, I need you to leave your country and your kindred, and I need you to go where I will show you. Mm -hmm. And so taking that leap, you know, to, to get away from the, 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 the pay that you know is coming every week or every two weeks. So once a month, have a way you get it. To know where your resources are coming from, the, the way you can see them. And we had to get to a place where we know that God is our source. He used these jobs. He used other things that are not jobs to provide for us. And we have to get real comfortable at being uncomfortable, but trusting that God is our security. He mm -hmm. will provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory, not our jobs, not our business, not our paychecks. And mm -hmm. when we learn that we must get dependent on God and not independent of God, mm -hmm. the leap is a whole lot better. Yeah. And the security doesn't come in knowing everything. The security knowing is that God knows everything mm -hmm. and that he's predestined our lives and everything that we need is on the path ahead. And we don't yeah. have to look back there for anything, but the lessons we we learned mm -hmm. and we need to start applying those lessons to right now and as we move forward. So learning um, to depend and trust God. And like you said, pray with you and pray for you that you will have everything you need and you will, because we give life to what we want. We've yeah. created everything that we've had in our life with our decisions, our choice, our thoughts, and what we spoke over our lives. Mm -hmm. So we speak right things. We speak the things we want to see and not the problems and circumstances that we're experiencing. We will have everything we need and mm -hmm. the source will always be God, but the resources can be any and everything. Mm -hmm. So I am just so elated to mm -hmm. um, just, just being on this journey with you and, and you being on this journey with me. And there's so many other people who want what you and I have, somebody to travel this road with that we can, you know, glean from each other. We can cheer each other on. We can celebrate with one another. We can allow us to get the data girl, you know, high five. You got that going on, you know, and it, and yeah. it just feels so good that to be on this journey with you and, and you be on this journey with me. And so let me ask you this. How, how did it, how was it for you to get from where you were being an attorney, raising your, your child 
And now you're this world traveler, you know, giving everything that God gave you to, to the world. How, how, how was that transition done? It was relatively smooth, to be honest. Um, I had had some practice rounds locally, you know, but nothing feels as natural and as divine and as right as where I am right now. I can't explain it. I don't know the source. Well, I do know the source of it, but I don't know how I'm going to maintain it. It's just that all I need to do is show up, be present, and speak to what I know the most high intends for my life, that I am not the beggar, that I am the lender, right? I'm not the borrower. I'm not going to be without my needs. I'm going to have dignity. I'm going to be wise. I'm going to listen for the voice of the most high when I'm directed to speak to someone or to call someone that may have an opportunity for me, that may um, have a link or a connection for me. So um, there are many things that I can do. I make products, you know, um, I speak, um, I can do coaching, I have books. So at any moment, the creator can take any one of these resources that he's been coaching me through, whether that's my divine self care strategy book. And one day, the most high may just say, I'm gonna turn your book into a major bestseller. And I don't have to worry anymore. So I think the important thing is to constantly be giving your gift to the world and then allow the most high to use your gifts and say, okay, I'm going to bless you through here. Thank you for providing me, <laughs> helping me along the way. And I don't have to create a miracle. So we don't necessarily have to rely on miracles so much when we have been doing the part that we were supposed to do. And all we have to do is offer that gift and say, creator, I've been working on this all this time. Could you bless this as a possible way to help me get what I need and share my gift with the world? So the more that we do to show the world what we have to offer, our solutions to the problems of the world, our ideas, our inventions, our gifts, the easier it is for the most time to just tap any one of those resources or all of them at the same time. Or put you in the place where the person who is in a position to hire you to speak before 100,000 people because of something. You know, it's just divine possibility. And all I have to do is show up and have myself in a position to take advantage of whatever opportunity is presented to me in the divine. Amen. That's what I'm working on right now. And actually, uh, for me, I'm learning how to be confident that what I have is only something that people can get from me. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people that do uh, sister circles, you know, women empowerment, but nobody does what I do mm -hmm. because I'm the only one that do it my way. Yeah. And I'm the only one that had this unique journey. And so it's like being being real secure and who God created all of us to be. And I'm learning that it's more about being than it is about doing. Just mm -hmm. show up and be the one and only you. There's nobody like you. There's no competition and nobody and being a better version of you. The, that takes place only within yourself. Mm -hmm. We are not looking to be carbon copies of carbon copies on the next so-and-so. <laughs> we are one of a kind. We're unique and we ex exclusively rare. Mm -hmm. And so as we walk in our uniqueness, as we show up and be who we are, and we give what God has in entrusted us to give, and actually, we're not even giving it. He's giving it. We're just showing up and he's doing the work with us, for us, to us, and through us. And then we realize that, you know, God is the one we bring when we show up. And he's doing great and mighty things, you know, through us. And we're the ones that say, here I am, Lord, send me. I'll go. And you can use my mouth. You can use yes. my hands. You can use yes. my feet. You can use my voice. And it has just been an amazing uh, journey. And I just thank you for coming on the show. And I just want you to share with the audience where they can find you, your contact information, your website, um, you know, any any uh, opportunities you have or any speaking engagements you have coming up. Just, you know, share with us how we can get more of you and what you provide. 
Thank you. So I have two websites, one for my food and emergency preparedness work, and one for my book, The Divine Self-Care Strategy, and my um, body, total body alignment work. So the website is called Queendom Care. That's Q-U-E-E-N-D-O-M-Q-A-R-E.com. So it's Queendom Care with a Q for care.com. And then my other website is Sheila Brown speaks.com. That's S H E I L A B R O W N. I now have four books. One of them is a free, well, I have a recipe for my famous, it's becoming world famous, collard green, vegan, gluten-free soup called divinity soup. If anyone goes to my website or follows me on Instagram at Sheila Brown Speaks, they can literally download that recipe right now for free. There's a link in my bio. You can also reach me via email at info at Sheila Brown Speaks, and you can reach me by phone. I have a number that you can text to get my water safety. That number is 202-952-6123. Just type the word water safety and I will send you the five page or presentation that shows you how to make water safe during an emergency. And um, if anyone is interested in bringing me out to talk about my book or do a book signing in your, you know, uh, book circles or your book clubs, um, I would love to do that for the Divine Self-Care Strategy, a wellness guide to total body alignment, which you can find right now on Amazon.com. Please leave a review. Reviews are so important to authors and also um my website at queendomcare.com you can get the book directly from me there um i am also on instagram at queendomcare which is again q u e e n d o m q a r e and i am accessible by email info at sheilabrownspeaks.com my website and facebook and instagram and of course you can also uh, reach out to me via text at 202-952-6123. And um, I look forward to growing with you, Sister Cheryl, and being on this journey towards discovery and fulfilling our divine purpose. Women. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you were truly a blessing. Every Every time I have an encounter with you, I mean, I'm blessed. <laughs> I, I'm enriched. I'm full. I, I just feel like, you know, mm -hmm. I've had that one of a kind experience that I can only have with you. And I just want to mm -hmm. just tell you to keep doing what you're doing. Let the Lord use you. Let the world know that you are part of the uh, solutions for the challenges that face us mm -hmm. throughout the world. So just keep doing what you're doing. And, um, uh, Thank you so much for coming on the show. So if you would like to be a part of um, my uh, network, um, you just feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to me by phone at 443-447-7267, or you may reach out to me on my website, www.sisters-circle.com. Until we meet again, be blessed and let the Lord make room for your gifts. God bless.